The New Testament reading is from Acts chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and a man lame from birth was being carried in. Carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple and call the beautiful gate so that he would ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, look at us, and he fixed his attention to them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. The people of God. Thanks be to God. I need a prayer this morning. Who's going to pray for the preacher today? I call my brother clergy who's here today and ask him if he would pray for me today. Amen. Thank you, Mark. Now, I abandoned the lectionary because it was very ponderous last week and all those lessons, every lesson feeling like, ooh. So I thought, what do I need to hear? And I'm preaching what I need to hear, this story. It's going to start this week and it's going to end next week because there's more to this story than we read today. But I was almost my own sermon illustration this morning. I'm going to tell you what happened to me at 4.30 this morning. My power went off. I was awake, I was getting ready to get up, the dog was ready to go outside. I got up between 4.30 and 5 every Sunday morning. How many of you do that? Six, Jackie says, but um, okay, not 4.30, huh? The power went off, which is an inconvenience, right? But what if you are living in the house where you're sleeping in a recliner that moves you up and down with a button that no longer works? I couldn't get out of the chair, it was fully reclined. And you all know that I don't work well, walk well, work or walk well right now because of my knee. I could not get out of the chair. The dog is barking at me, and I thought, well, I wonder what they're going to do. Now, I did manage to get my toes wrapped around the cord of my phone and pull it up and get it on my lap. And I thought, well, who am I going to call? Kara has a key to my house. She's in Ocean City. Elizabeth Lomaster had a key to my house. She just moved to Arizona last week to get her new appointment yesterday. I have a friend who has the key to my house, but I thought, even if he came in, what is he going to do? Because he came once before when the, when the cord pulled out of the wall, but this was not a cord pulled out of the wall business. This was the Baltimore Gas and Electric con Company had an outage in my area. But half an hour later, it came on. Thank you, Jesus, which is what I said when it came on and got up and ran to the bathroom and let the dog out and all that good stuff. But... Um, made me think about this lesson today. If you can't walk, you're really sort of stuck, aren't you? It reminded me of another story that I had in my past when I broke my ankle in seminary. I tripped on a loose flagstone and was on the ground before I realized what happened. The person I was talking with said, where'd you go? Where'd you go? Where are you? And I said, I'm down here. And she said, what happened? I said, my leg broke. She said, oh, get up. You just don't want to take your exams because it was finals week. She said, why do you think your leg broke? I said, because I heard this giant snap when I fell. Sure enough, it was broken, and Kat Cheney, who was the pastor in our area, was a first-year student. I was a third-year student, and we didn't really have any classes together. And she came up to me and said, somebody asked me to look at your leg. And I said, why? She said, I'm a thoracic surgeon in addition to being a seminary student. I said, but are you an x-ray machine? She said, no, I'm not an x-ray machine. But she looked at my leg and said, I know it's broken because it's got all sorts of strange colors radiating out. She said, you better go to the hospital or you're going to have blood poisoning. Went to the hospital, and certainly my leg was broken. 
and about six weeks into breaking my leg, I went to the doctor and he said, you know, I think you pull an x-ray and see if it's okay. And he x-rayed and he said, I'm going to take off the cast. It was the middle of winter. It was a snowy, wet, icky day in D.C. He took the cast off and then we realized I didn't have a shoe to put on. So I walked out with the boot flapping on my foot and the most skinny, scrawny, emaciated, white, hairy leg you've ever seen. Because in six weeks, your, your muscle can atrophy very much. And I had a hard time walking, putting weight on it. Even though I had a walking cast, I couldn't put weight on it because it was just such a spindly little leg. Imagine being not able to walk since birth. That's what the man was living with in this story. Not able to walk since birth. He was blessed. He was lucky. Somebody carried him every day to the beautiful temple gate. We don't know that the gate called beautiful has anything to do with the story. Some people say it's the gate where the rich people went in, which is why he would beg there. But we know Peter and John had nothing to give him in that respect, did they? They even said, we have no gold, we have no silver. But he's expecting a handout. How many of you have ever passed someone sitting and begging on the side of the road? How many of you try not to make eye contact with the person? Because what happens when you make eye contact? They got you, don't they? And so people would sort of look at this man and maybe feel guilty and give him some money as they were on the way into the temple. He's not in the temple. He's outside the temple. That's an important part of this story. And then John and Peter come up, and they make eye contact with him, and he says, ha, 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 I got him now. We get some money from these guys, certainly. Peter looks at him and says, I have no gold, I have no silver. What I have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ. Stand up and walk. I have no gold, I have no silver, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ. Stand up and walk. And what happens? The guy walks. It doesn't matter that he's never walked before. Now, I didn't walk until I was probably 18 months old, my mother said, because I just knew that somebody would pick me up. I was not the first baby in the family. Somebody would pick me up and carry me where I needed to go, so why bother to walk, right? I had free transportation all the time. It wasn't until my cousin, Billy, who was six months younger than me, or six weeks younger than me, got up and walked one day and said, oh, look at him go. Well, they said, she looked at my face like, I'll show that boy, and I got up and walked. I didn't crawl, I just got up and walked one day. But usually you crawl, right, or you creep, and then you learn to crawl, you get your knees under you, and you get up, and what happens when you start to toddle? Why do we call toddlers toddlers? They walk like drunks. They fall over a lot, don't they? So this man gets up and walks. Not only does he walk, he starts to dance a little bit. He's jumping. He's praising God. And people knew that this man couldn't walk. This wasn't somebody that they brought in. This wasn't a shill from some tent healer. This was a man that they knew from birth had not been able to walk. And he's jumping up, praising God. Where does he go to praise God? Inside the temple where he had not been allowed to go before. Why wasn't he in the temple before? Well, he was pretty much unclean because of his situation. Because people saw that he couldn't walk, and what did they think? Well, God is punishing him for something he's done. And just his physical inability to stand up and walk would make him unclean. In our sense of the word, you know, not scrubbed, but unclean in a different way, unclean, unable to go to God. Now he is inside the temple, and he's proclaiming his faith in God. So what do we do with this story? Why do I need to hear it? Because I need to get up and walk, for one thing. Not that God is going to necessarily heal me spontaneously. It would be nice if God did, but I'm not expecting that. I need a new knee before that happens. But what else, what else do you learn? If, you're, if you put yourself in this position of the man, what do you need from this story? What do you need, Toby? Okay, you need to redirect your attention from your current condition to what it could be, right? Your future possibilities. I need to know that God sees me in my pain. God looked into my living room and said, Oh, Terry's stuck in that chair. I've got to get her out of there. And I tell you, I went back and forth. I'll tell you what I did. Went back and forth between praying and cussing a little bit. I would tell me you wouldn't do the same. Just a little bit. Like, oh, heck. She said, sort of, kind of. That's a paraphrase of what I said. It was more like, oh, sugar, honey, iced tea. I cannot get out of this chair. 
And it was like, God, help me, Lord, help me. And then the power came back on, not because necessarily I prayed, but sometimes do you not know, need to know that God sees you where you are, as you are in your pain, in your brokenness, in your despair, when you're stuck and you can't get up? You need to know that God sees you there and does not leave you alone. But what if you're Peter and John? Let's put this on Peter's greatest hits list. What did Peter do before Pentecost? Call the sermon post-Pentecost Peter. What was Peter like before Pentecost? I think the word that we use today is a hot mess. A hot mess. What happens when Peter tries to walk on water? He gets scared and he falls in. What happens when Peter is at the Transfiguration with John again? These two have some real time together, don't they? They're up there and he sees who Jesus really is. Jesus is shining and Moses is there and Elijah, the law and the prophets. And what does Peter say? Lord, you want me to build a tabernacle? You want me to put up a tent, Lord? What are we going to do? How are we going to stay here? What are we going to do? God has to say, Peter, hush up and listen. Hush. That's the only thing that will shut him up, hearing God's voice. Peter the night before Jesus dies, what does he do? He denies even knowing him after saying, when Jesus said, one of you is going to desert, deny me, all of you are going to desert me, one of you is going to betray me, Peter said, I don't care what the rest of them do, Lord, I will never, I will follow you even to death. Even to death. And then 15 minutes later, he's like, I don't know him. Who's that guy? I don't know him. I'm sorry, I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know him at all. I don't know him at all. And imagine Peter, he gets it right one time when Jesus says, what are people saying about me? Well, some say you're Elijah, some say you're John the Baptist. What do you say about me? I say you're the son of the living God. I was just surprised him too, and Jesus said, I can build a church on that. On that I can build a church. And then he says, now that you know who I am, let me know what's going to happen. And he says to, that he's going to die, and Peter goes, la, 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 I can't hear that, Lord. No, 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 not you, Lord. Don't even say that, Lord. No, 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 no. And Jesus goes from saying, I can build a church on that rock to what? Get behind me who? Satan. A little bit of comeuppance for Peter there. Peter has had some real moments in his life, hasn't he? And here he is, Pentecost, 50 days after Jesus is raised from the dead, and maybe a couple days past that. And here's Peter saying at the temple. Who's in the temple? Jews. Where were they hiding the night of his resurrection for fear of the who? The Jews. His own people, he's scared of them because they might think, oh, this guy was with that Jesus character. We've got to get rid of this movement once and for all. We've got to get these guys and put them down once and for all. And there he's saying, I don't have gold, I don't have silver. What I have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ. Stand up and walk. It gives me goosebumps. I always like to have the gospel in a service, which is why we had the uh, call to worship we had. John 14, which begins, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. That's why I go to prepare a place for you. When I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come bring you to myself, so that where I may am, you may be also, always. And this is what he says, Believe me that I am in the Father, the Father is in me. And if you do not, then believe because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, Jesus says, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do and, in fact, will do greater works than these because I'm going to the Father. Greater works than these. Healing, calling people from the dead, raising up the downcast, touching the unclean. This is who Jesus is, and this is who he equips Peter and John to be. They finally get it, and Peter says to the man, I don't have gold, I don't have silver, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. Stand up and walk. The guy says, okay, and he gets up and he walks. That's what Jesus says to me when I feel tired, when I feel like I can't go on, when I feel like, why didn't I just go to welding school? I'd make a lot more money if I went to welding school. I'd have weekends off if I went to welding school. But no, somebody wants to be baptized, and I know again why God called me to do this work and why I do this work, because that is who I am called to be, that is who I will be. Now, does that mean we're all going to get healed? Does that mean God's going to say, Terry, get up out of that rollator and dance? Probably not. God's saying, get to the doctor and get a new knee, girl. 
Peggy Johnson is one of my best friends. She's also a bishop of the United Methodist Church. She just came out of retirement and is serving in the greater New England area now. But she was born without one eye. I had her come to Harmony. We did a month-long series of sermons on ministry with people with disabling conditions. Peggy started her sermon by saying, I was born with one eye. I had everybody in the place just hooked right there. And we have some great Peggy eye stories I'll tell you after service if you want, because she used to take it out at night and put it in the cup between us on the nightstand. When we were at camp, and I said, if I drink that one night, I'm going to sue you. She said, I'll sue you, because that's an expensive little thing there. But the best, i got to tell you this one. This is just so great. Kids at deaf camp were just going nuts at night. They're screaming and yelling and la, 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 la. They sound like peacocks, shrill little screams. And then you'd turn the lights on, maybe... I'd say, I can hear you. And they're like, ah, ha, 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 ha. So we took turns going and yelling at kids. She went down once, and said, my turn. She went down the hall. The kids were like, oh. They didn't make any sound after that. And I said, what is, what did you do? And she said, I don't know. She flipped the light on. She had her eye in sideways. She had one horizontal, one vertical. I said, from now on, let's do that every night. Because I shut them right up. They went to sleep. She loves it when I tell that story. But she went to a healing service when she was in college, just out of high school. It was in a tent, as healing services often are. And the preacher said, I'm gonna heal you all if you have faith enough. Peggy was there with her artificial eye and she was there with someone with with a prosthetic leg and a brace on the leg and someone with a back brace. And the guy said, all right, if you're gonna come up here, you gotta leave your stuff on the table. So her friend took off the prosthetic leg and left it there, and her friend took off the back brace and left it there. She put her eye on the table and said, on the way home, she grabbed it and put it in because she knew her mother would kill her because they're about $2,000 each. She came home without her eye, and the pastor said, you'd have no faith. She had to drive home because the guy without the back brace had to lie down in the back, and the woman without the prosthetic leg couldn't drive anymore because God did not spontaneously grow up her a new leg. That's not what the story is about, though, isn't it? God can heal us. God can heal my leg, and I could jump up and dance if God so chose. But that's not what I need. But God heals people of their uncleanliness. God heals people of their inner disease. God heals people of their self-doubt. God heals people of all kinds of things. We have to ask ourselves, who are the people who cannot get in our doors? And we have a ramp. We have a wheelchair-accessible restroom. We have some good accessibility features. There are people who cannot get in here any church, not our church necessarily, but any church. One of the people who spoke when I did my month of disabling conditions was the mother of a girl with autism. They had been asked to leave so many churches because they could not keep her quiet. She would go, through the whole service, and people said, we just can't take that. Can you take her somewhere else? And when I was in Frederick years ago, a man was there who had walked away from alcohol and drugs, walked away from it because of an experience of grace. And he worked at the rescue mission in Frederick. And he brought men who were in his 12-step program, men who didn't know a higher power named Jesus Christ, and he shared his faith in Christ with them. They wanted that. They wanted what he had. They wanted to be well. They knew that he had turned his life around, and they knew that Christ had done it for him. He went to church, and he came to me, and he said, is it all right if I bring these guys with me to worship? And I said, absolutely. And he said, wait, before you finish that, he said, this is the fourth church we've tried. Four times, pastors have come to us after two weeks and said, please don't bring them back here. They scare the women because they had tattoos, and they smelled like cigarette smoke, not because they were threatening anybody. They were there looking for Christ and told, nope, you can't come here. You scare our women. Not a good thing. So who can't come in our doors, meaning the church universal, not Epworth, but maybe Epworth. We have all sorts of people out there who feel that they cannot come to God because of what they've done, because they have been broken by the world, maybe physically, but mostly spiritually and inside their hearts. This is who Christ calls us to serve. This is who Christ calls us to say, I don't have gold, I don't have silver, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. Walk in these doors where you will be welcome. Walk in these doors where you will be loved. 
have to ask ourselves too about the crowd. Maybe we're just in the crowd right now. Maybe you think I can't do that. I can't speak. I can't pray for the preacher because I can't talk in front of people. You can talk in front of anybody. I've heard you talk. I've heard every person in this room, I think, talk. I know you have speech. You have words. But if you're not praying here, then you're not praying out there, I don't believe either. You pray in your heart and you pray quietly, but you have to learn to pray out loud so that other people can hear you say, in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. Or at least be like the crowd that is in amazement, that praises God because they knew what had happened in their midst. So I don't know who you are in this story. I'm everybody in this story. I'm the crowd that's amazed. I'm Peter and John who hesitantly answers my call some days. I'm the guy who needs healing. Wherever you find yourself in this story, know that Christ comes to you as you are, where you are, and Christ will not leave you there. He will take you to new heights. All you have to do is get up and walk. Amen, amen, amen. Let's stand up.